All right. So our next speaker is David Gaiotto, and he will talk about perturbative calculations in twisted 4D gauge theories. So uh, I'm sorry I couldn't make it uh, physically to the conference, uh, but if, you, if you're interested in the topic, you can uh, meet my collaborators, which was picture is shown here, uh, which I think most of which are physically present and will be very happy to discuss the uh, this, this subject with you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, some work done over the last year. Part of it is going to uh, be published very soon. Part of it will take a bit more time. Uh, it's about perturbative calculations in twisted uh, gauge theories, supersymmetric gauge theories in four dimensions. So the main subject of the talk are four dimensional gauge theories with an equal one supersymmetry. This is the minimal amount of Can you hear me? Because there is uh, like your screen is quite stretched out. And I'm... Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, Could you try to fit to the screen or something? Yes, like this? let me try again. I don't know why this is happening. Uh, let's try like that. Uh, so. You know what? Let me type different software. So Zoom is behaving in this other way. Okay. Okay. Is this okay? Uh, no, but maybe we could you could try without going to the full screen if that's the is this better. I mean this way it works. So if we can make it better, we can stick to it, I think. Uh, okay, let me just see if I can remove the One second, I move the sidebar. Okay, let's try like that. Yes, yes. Okay, so uh, the main subject of the talk are four dimensional gauge theories with an equal one supersymmetry, which is the minimal amount of supersymmetry which is uh, possible in four dimensions, which means four supercharges organized into. Uh, the two two-dimensional representation, spin representations of the spin four rotation group. Uh, I will denote the Karelam, these are Karelam super charges as Qs and Q bars, and the anti commute to translations, to the four translations of space time. Uh, these kind of gauge theories are very uh, important in theoretical physics. On the, 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 the simplest reason is that they manifest interesting. A phenomena such as confinement or kind of symmetry breaking, which are also very important in understanding the real world. And so they can provide hopefully some toy models for this phenomena. Uh, furthermore, they are often used in model building of the perhaps less or less often based. Uh, on a theoretic, on a more theoretical perspective, uh, they enjoy a lot of they're, they're a beautiful playground because they enjoy a lot of infra, a lot of dualities. Uh, which are cyber duality and, and, its, uh, uh, and its relatives. And also, they are just computational tools which are available in these theories, which are not available in non-supersymmetric theories, and which sometimes allow you to, to get a good handle of the, of the phase diagram and, and the IR physics, which even, even though they are strongly coupled. Uh, finally, they, they also provide a lot of examples of holography uh, as there, are, there is a vast family of uh, type 2 beast in the backgrounds, such as APS5 times Sasaki Einstein, which have a lot of duals which are quiver in equal one gauge theories. Uh, but the reason I'm going to talk about these theories at string math is because I believe that uh, recent mathematical progress gives us the, the chance for some non trivial cross fertilization cross between mathematics and physics in this topic. Uh, in, in the same way as it has happened in other, in other number of dimensions or number of supersymmetries. The, the lens through which I'm going to look at this theories is that of the holomorphic twist. Concretely, uh, this means that 
we can take a we can take a photo measurement for one gauge theory. We pick one of the Kara supercharges. We take the cohomology of the supercharge, which is important. This simplifies the theory uh, to a, to another quantum, to give you another quantum field theory, which has uh, you know, often fewer fields and uh, simpler equations of motion and simpler uh, dynamics. It's usually mathematically more treatable, and it captures some piece, some protected part of the original theory. In, in this particular case, the twist gives a theory which is holomorphic, at least in the cohomological sense, because operators which belong to this holomorphic the theory had the property that um, anthelomorphic derivatives of them are Q exact. More specifically, when you pick a supercharge, you are automatically equipping space time with the complex structure. And then the theory uh, depends only on this complex structure rather than on the full metric of space time. In a sense, this makes it analogous to two dimensional homomorphic theories, which are a very well studied and very important subject in mathematics and physics, um, a subject of vertex algebras. Um, and much like two dimensional theories, uh, the most the, the very striking aspect of these holomorphic twisted theories is that they have an infinite symmetry algebra. Uh, essentially, they, they come equipped with something like uh, they transform under the complex inflectum of physics into space time. And also, if you have a favorable symmetry in the physical theory, you get things like holomorphic position dependent. Uh, flavor rotations. They are kind of a four-dimensional version of the Casmodiato. And so the presence of this extended symmetry is what essentially makes me hope that uh, holomorphic theories, or the holomorphic twist to four-dimensional important theories, uh, could lead to, to important, uh, important new developments uh, and motivated our, our, our work over the last, over the last year. Are there any questions? Okay, so uh, to, to give us a couple of extra motivations. Oh, yes, please. Go ahead with the question. There is a raised hand. What is it from before? So, what is the uh, what is the metric of space time you're assuming? I'm not assuming a specific metric. Uh, and these theories can be coupled to a complex structure. So, uh, as we as we will discuss perhaps more later, a generic holomorphic twist of a four-dimensional equivalent theory can be placed on any any manifold which has a holomorphic symplectic form, the body globally defined holomorphic symplectic form. Uh, so if the theory is conformal, you can place it on any on any complex manifold. So even three plus one dimensions is applicable, right? Okay, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, well, I today I will be mostly discuss uh, Euclidean theories, but there is no obstruction in thinking in Lorentzian signature, uh, except that whenever I say the word holomorphic, uh, you will have to replace it with you know left moving in some plane and holomorphic in the another plane in, in a 3 comma 1 signature or in a 2 comma 2 signature just moving uh, left moving in the two in, in two planes i mean you you should think about the uh, two-dimensional quantity theory for, for an example of that right if you take a, a two-dimensional holomorphic theory like a car for fermion and you go to Lorentz signature then you get fermions who just move left in the speed of light. Okay. So let me give you two motivations to look at this holomorphic twist, two further motivations to this holomorphic twist. Uh, first of all, the consider a theory which is super conformal, meaning a theory which is scale invariant, and then scale invariance is extended automatically to super conformal symmetry. Which in, was both the spot conformal symmetry group includes both the bosonic conformal group in, in three dimensions of, of 
in four dimensions, sorry, uh, a, a one asymmetry and eight fermionic generators for which are the original supersymmetries and for which are super extra super conformal symmetries, which are related to the supersymmetries by inversion. Uh, if you have a super conformal field theory and then you call one super conformal field theory, uh, there is a very powerful tool, which is the super conformal index. This is essentially the Witten index uh, for the space of local operators, graded by some fugacities, which uh, essentially measure the, the spin of, of, of local operators in two planes. Uh, the the Witten index, as usual, is very robust. And in particular, it can be computed in the free theory exactly. And then it remains the same once you turn on interactions. And it has been, you know, the spoken formal indices of dual theories have been matched in the past. And uh, in general, it gives, you, it gives you a lot of information about this interacting, this strong interacting quantum field theories. Uh, the Witten index formally counts operators which are annihilated both by, both by a supercharge and an emission contract is for conformal charge. But as usual for the Witten index, it can also be interpreted as counting uh, a thing as essentially a, another character for the cohomology of one of the supercharges. So essentially, the, the, the superconformal index just counts local operators in the holomorphic twist of the superconformal field theory. And you can even interpret it as a partition function in a certain complex manifold for this holomorphic, uh, holomorphically twisted theory. Which, by the way, raises the possibility that one could, could generalize the conformal index to some interesting correlation functions of the, of the holomorphic theory. Uh, something which I have not seen done, but would be an interesting uh, future development. So, right, so from this perspective, the study the lobophic twist of a formation in one theory is essentially the same as category fine, the superconformal index. Uh, of course, the superconformal index can only be defined for a superconformal field theory, but the lobophic twist can be applied to any supersymmetric uh, formation in one theory. Essentially, what happens is that if the theory is not conformal, you lose one of these fugacities and, this, and the spaces sort of become more infinite dimensional, meaning that the trace uh, is not well defined anymore. But individuals, you know, if you create things by, fair, by ghost number, uh, the individual, individual vector spaces are still well defined and finite dimensional. Uh, so the, the uh, almost at least still makes sense, even if the theory is not conformal. Another useful perspective is to, to, to look at another tool which has been commonly used to study four dimensional and equal one theories, which is the, the Karal ring. The Karal ring is defined by considering operators which are annihilated by both Karal supercharges, modulo operators which are in the image of either of the two. This is a bit of a weird definition. It's not quite a cohomology problem, uh, but it turns out to be very useful. In particular, because all the deri all derivatives of operators are uh, in the image of some of the are in the space that you're throwing away, uh, the OP of, of of local operators in the car ring is non-singular and it defines a ring structure. That's why it's called the car ring. Intuitively, uh, the car ring gives information about the space of vacuum of the theory, because every, every vacuum of the theory gives, a, gives the Carroll operator some expectation values. Uh, so it gives a point in the spectrum of the Carroll ring. An important feature of the Carroll ring is that quantum corrections to the Carroll ring, although exist, uh, they, are some, they are often rather constrained by symmetries. And so in the past, there have been many examples where people could compute the Carroll ring and use it to determine the, the phase structure of the, of the quantum, of the quantum of an equal one quantum field theory. Uh, another reason the carving is important is that essentially all renormalizable interactions in four-dimensional H theories are controlled by F terms, which are obtained from Carroll operators by acting with, uh, which are terms in the Lagrangian, which are obtained from Carroll operators by acting with four with the, with the anti carroll supercharges. So the car ring is, is a very well understood, very, uh, very 
important tool. And the Lomofi twist is sort of intermediate between the full physical theory and the carving because it involves operators which are neglected only by one supercharge. Furthermore, it turns out that the carving is actually roughly embedded inside the Lomofi twist, although this is not quite obvious. Um, and so the, the and many of the calculations that people have done about the carving find the natural home in the study of the Lomofic twist of the theory. So it's really, the Lomofic twist is really a natural extension of the, of the work done on the carving. And indeed, uh, the Lomofic twist could be characterized as a study of a semi carving of the theory, in the sense that in the I mean, as I mentioned before, right, in the holomorphic twist, uh, operators behave as they are holomorphic in space time. Uh, but this is actually enough to allow you to multiply operators because, although in principle, there could be monomorphic or be singularities as I bring operators together, it's actually impossible to write down an holomorphic function which has monomorphic singularities just at one point in situ. And so, you get a ring. But you get more than a ring. Uh, the space of local operators in the homomorphic twist has a lot of uh, algebraic structure, which is uh, concisely denoted as an homomorphic factorization algebra. Um, uh, I think this is a good place for uh, questions, if you have any. Otherwise, I can keep going. Okay. So, sorry, I have a question. Uh, did, are you assuming an R symmetry in the in this whole story, Albert? Sorry, are you assuming an R symmetry in the in the story? No, no. Okay. Uh, so, if the theory is super conformal, there will be an R symmetry. If there is an R symmetry, the theory will behave as if it was super conformal in the Lomov twist, uh, but you don't have to have an an R symmetry. I will, I will actually discuss the role of the symmetry momentarily. So uh, my question is this chiral ring, uh, of chiral ring, does it assume any twisting of the theory, right? I mean, because uh, as you were saying- No, so the uh, ring was defined without the notion yeah, of twisting. Yeah. And it involves, it doesn't involve quite a cohomology problem. So it's not, does not live inside the twisted world uh, in a natural way. Uh, mm -hmm. Although, it seems to appear as a, as a sub, as a, as a sort of a subset of the Lomorphic twist. Yeah. Okay. So, in order to define this this bigger algebraic structure, I uh, use something called a, a descent relation. I mean, uh, every every local operator in the Lomorphic twist come equipped with a collection of descendants, which are forms on space time. Uh, these are produced by acting with anti chiral supercharges, and you can collect them all together into, into uh, a, a, what we could call a semi chiral superfield, uh, which is, I don't know, here is O, uh, which, uh, I mean, if, you, if you're familiar with superspace, this is just a standard superfield, except that I'm identifying the superspace coordinates with antelomorphic differentials as it is convenient. And as you do so, um, <clears throat> the superspace derivative, which annihilates uh, this sort of semi-carol operators, become Q plus del bar, where del bar is the del bar operator. So there's sort of this relation where you know, Q of O0 is 0, because it's in, co in, the, in, the, in cohomology. But then you find an operator O1, such that Q of O1 is the same as del bar of O0 and so on and so forth. And using this descent relation, using these form descendants, you can define operations. So you take an operator, let me call it, say A, you take a descendant of A, you wedge it with some holomorphic form, so, so like the power of C times the C squared, and you integrate it on a sphere surrounding the second operator. 
Uh, this gives you an infinite family of brackets, which are collected in what's called the lambda bracket. Uh, and you can define analogous hyper operations involving a collection of, uh, of three or more operators integrated over some cycles on the configuration space of points. And this, this drive structure is what's called the zoomorphic factorization algebra. And is the reason for this infinite symmetry enhancement, because essentially every operator gives you an infinite power of symmetries by thanks to the lambda bracket. For example, if you take uh, any physical theory, we'll have, it will have a stress tensor, which is part of a super, super multiplet. And there is a, an element to the super multiplet, which uh, whose lambda bracket generates the action of essentially any monomorphic diffeomorphism of space time. This, uh, this object that I can call a monomorphic stress tensor uh, exists and is Q closed in uh, conformal field theories, in which case it gives you an extension of the conformal, sort of the monomorphic conformal group. On the, in in non-conformal field theories, in theories which have no asymmetry, uh, it's not Q closed, but Q on this holomorphic stress tensor gives you a total derivative. And so the divergence of the stress tensor is still Q closed, and it generates uh, Hamiltonian symplectomorphisms of space time. So, which are sort of an infinite extension of uh, holomorphic Lorentz transformations. So, depending if your theory is a CFT or not, you might have a bigger or smaller infinite dimensional symmetry group, which is kind of a four dimensional analog of the Virasoro uh, symmetry. Similarly, if you have a flavor current, there is always an element to the super multiplet, which can be used to generate uh, position dependent flavor rotations, holomorphic position dependent flavor, flavor rotations, and which is a kind of a four dimensional analog of the smoothie algebra. And so you have you know, the combination of this ring structure and these infinite symmetries uh, seems like a very large symmetry algebra whose representation theory is still uh, not well studied and which could potentially give the same, you know, give an analogously powerful tool as what vertex algebra gives us for two-dimensional uh, holomorphic theories. And so uh, the objective of this, of this research pro project uh, that I've been working on for the last year uh, is to learn how to do calculations in these homomorphic theories, uh, learn how to compute the quantum corrected ring structure and lambda brackets and homomorphic factorization algebra. And uh, this is what's gonna, what I'm going to describe uh, in, the rest, uh, in the rest of the talk. Yeah, so, so, so my question is uh, related uh, for the for the chiral ring since the uh, since the supersymmetry operators they they are not nil potent I mean uh, they, they don't square to zero. Yes, how they do. Does, how does huh? they do? They, they, they square to the momentum operator, right? No, Q, as you see, the anti commutator of Q and Q bar gives you the moment to the translation generators. But Q1 and Q2, the Q1 and Q2 are both new potent. I see. Okay. So in the car ring, uh, but it's true that they are, yeah, that's right. So uh, the car ring is still defined by something annihilated by both, both Qs. So in that case, what is the additional advantage of defining a Q by twisting the theory? Because you already have Qs which are nil potent. I am just use, twisting just means using one of those cues to pass to cohomology. Yeah, I mean, uh, using two cues would further constrain the theory so that you can compute more things, right? Yeah, so the car, you can compute more things, presumably in the car ring than in the Lomasi twist. Although it's not quite clear to me that it's that's, that's the case. And furthermore, the car ring is not defined by a twisting operation because it's not the cohomology of, of a square chart. It's not a cohomology problem. Yeah, but you can define it as a cohomology problem, right? No. Because, because, because you have Q, Q alpha equal to zero modulo Q alpha O prime, which is the same as a cohomology. No, it's not a cohomology because there are two Qs. 
what is the what is the problem with having two queues in a cohomology? That's a cohomology would mean taking some inner combination of those queues, not both. And because there is a symmetry rotating them into each other, whatever linear combination you use will give you the same answer, which is not the same as looking at operators annihilated by both. So, I thought, I mean, uh, it's definitely true that you can try to relate the two problems, especially if you take into account rotational symmetry. So as far as I understand, uh, the, the, the rotational invariant local operators in the current range also belong to the holomorphic twist. And you can make try to make similar statements for operators which have spin, uh, which is sort of underlies the, what I was saying, that the current range sort of leaves inside the holomorphic twist, although not, not in a completely straightforward way. You can always take a linear combination of two Qs and define a Q, which is the holomorphic, uh, I mean, which is the uh, holomorphic twist. I mean, which is a, which you can, you can define a cohomology by taking a linear combination of the two Qs, right? Yes, which is the same as taking one of them. Uh, because of yeah, the same 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 anyway, so I think I, can, I need to keep going on. Uh, okay. Otherwise, we run out of time. So, uh, quantum corrections. First of all, uh, it's evident that there are going to be quantum corrections simply because uh, we know that there are quantum field theories, which are classically scale invariant, but not quantum mechanically. So there are definitely theories for which this homomorphic stress tensor is Q closed classically, but quantum mechanically is not. So there must be quantum correction from loop because that's where the beta function arises from. And there are many other examples in, in the literature on the Carroll range where people have computed perturbative corrections at one loop to Carroll ring. Uh, to the current ring. So I think it's called the generalized Cornish anomaly. And in general, these are also always sort of like a one loop anomaly to the symmetries, which to the sort of infinite dimensional symmetries generated by the operators of the homomorphic twist. And it, it doesn't, you know, it's not too hard to write down the you know, the most general one loop effect, one loop correction to the differential in these homomorphic theories. And once you do that, you realize that the one loop corrected differential is actually not important. So that's clear that it has to be higher loop corrections to fix that. And, and so the, you know, the, the beginning of our project was just to ask which kind of common diagrams contribute to these higher loop corrections and how can we compute them? Uh, I should stress that on top of these perturbative corrections, there will also be non perturbative corrections, uh, which we do, know at this, do not know at this point if they're computable or not. They might be computable in the sense that it might be possible that there is something like an integral of the space of instant on configurations of the theory or something like that, which might compute them. But in any case, our hope is that the symmetry constraints, the representation theory of this uh, Lomofic for transition will be you know, constraining enough to allow us to perhaps guess the non perturbative corrections, at least in simple examples. So this is our general strategy, compute the perturbative factorization algebra, and then check, check how constraining it is and how deformable it is. There are many situations where the deformations of these algebraic structures are sufficiently constrained that uh, one can parameterize the non-perturbative corrections in some finite way. Um, the one, one, one amusing observation is actually that you, you, we, we encountered after we started doing some of these perturbative calculations is that actually the whole collection of perturbative corrections is actually contained within the homomorphic factorization algebra of the free theory. In the sense that if you take an, an operator which is in the cohomology of the free theory and you have to perturbative differential or some perturbative corrections to the brackets, you get the, the, the perturbative, the, the perturbative corrections are, take the form of higher brackets of the free theory involving the operator we're acting on and a certain number of copies of the interactions. So for example, the three level corrections to the free differential are just the, bra the zero to the bracket between the interaction and the operator. The 
while loop corrections are actually a three bracket involving two interactions in an operator. If you think about the triangle diagram, you know, there are two interactions at the vertices and one operator in the operator at the third vertex, and so on and so forth. So our perturbative calculations are actually secretly compute, just computing the holomorphic factorization algebra for the free theory. Uh, and sort of giving a Feynman direct expansion of this holomorphic factorization algebra. And this uh, is actually completely analogous to what has happened in the past. For example, in Conservish calculations for the formality theorem, Conservish defined what was essentially a posteriori an holomorphic, a, a topological factorization algebra on half plane uh, by using Feynman diagrams in the free two dimensional be twisted Karal multiplets. So there is sort of general strategy where you uh, build some, where you compute Feynman diagrams or do some similar calculation to build sort of a, a general infrastructure in which then you insert the data of your theory to find a factorization algebra. And then deform, deforming by some other an element, you can get the perturbative corrections to the factorization algebra. Uh, another example that was very useful in our, uh, in our understanding of the problem was the was the calculations I did with uh, with uh, Moore and Witten about uh, webs uh, web algebras where we we used infrared data in this instrumental like topological distributed theories again to build these factorization algebras uh, in a purely uh, algebraic way. Which kind of Feynman diagrams appear in the calculation? Um, well, essentially, all of the lomorphic twist theories, uh, at the, at the low the free theory, can be described in a, number, in a uniform way. You have some superfields, which might be bosonic or fermionics. Uh, they have, you know, a zero form, a one form, and true form components and satisfy the same relation. Um, the the genetic term is just that of a it's a sort of four-dimensional generalization of a beta gamma of the C system, something the form you know phi del bar phi, where the bar is the ball operator. Uh, it pairs up the, the zero and the one form components of the superfields, which is actually very convenient because it means that the zero form components, which are the ones here in the free cohomology, don't have any weak contractions with each other. I have a question. Uh, uh, let, let's save the remaining questions for the end of the talk. Sorry, I'm, I'm looking at the time and I think a little, I'm a little bit short. Um, so the, when you do calculations, you're going to use a super, a super space propagator, which is, is, is identified with one form. And so uh, the tier of one forms and the, the body the differential is very, so very very helpful in these, in these calculations. And some very basic considerations on form degrees tell you that the only Feynman diagrams we contribute are what's called Laman graphs, which are very, graphs such that uh, if you take twice the number of vertices minus the number of edges, you, it's equal to three. And for every induced subgraph, this number is greater than three. The simplest Laman graph is a segment. You know, with a single weak contraction, which controls three level calculations. At one loop, there is a triangle involving three weak contractions. Uh, and this, you know, this is sort of a classical triangle anomaly uh, generalized to these infinite dimensional symmetries. Uh, it's loops, there is something with two triangles and so on and so forth. Uh, we formulated some sort of universal master integrals, which control perturbative corrections to you know all sort of uh, brackets and and to the differential of the of the homomorphic lattice theory. These uh, master integrals are, are a function of some holomorphic momenta, one for each external vertex, as well as some auxiliary shift holomorphic shift coordinates. Um, the explicit formula of this master integral is uh, is actually something which we believe is quite universal in the sense that you can write similar formula in any sort of holomorphic topological theory uh, for whatever almost for whatever factorization algebra uh, is relevant for the theory. Um, 
I haven't seen this formula written down before. Uh, I would love to understand uh, if it was, you know, uh, understand it a bit better, but that's what it is. Uh, you take your graph, you fix the position of one vertex at the origin, and you integrate to the position of the other vertices. With a, you, you add an allomorphic measure, which uh, includes the effect of the external momentum. And then you take a product of propagators, possibly with these, like, with these auxiliary shifts of the allomorphic coordinates, add to the bar on the whole thing, and integrate over, over the whole space time. Integrate all the, all the vertices except the fixed one on, on space time. Uh, this calculation at first sight is rather complicated. I mean, the propagators are still uh, rather intricate, but working on it for a while, we found a way to simplify dramatically to a Fourier transform, essentially, of a complicated polyhedral region in the, in the, in the space of loop momenta, in form of loop momenta. Uh, the region, this, this form makes it evident that the answer is, is UV and IR finite, so it's really a well-defined calculation. And furthermore, there is a purely geometric quadratic identity which holds for these master integrals and which automatically implies that they do indeed define the coefficients for this homomorphic, for an homomorphic factorization algebra. Uh, again, this is very analogous to the calculation which was done by, by Konsevich, uh, where there were some configuration space points on the plane. It was properties implied the factorization algebra properties for the for the for the for the, for the theory in the half plane, the topological theory in the half plane. And another striking property of these master integrals is that the quadratic identities appear to be sufficiently powerful to essentially determine them uh, from scratch. So, I mean, this is something we only know experimentally, but we believe it to be true. Uh, you don't actually need to do any of these square transforms of these uh, explicit integrals, just the, the consistency conditions, these quadratic relations are sufficient to fix the whole structure. Uh, the writing down the integrals is a guarantee for you that the structure actually exists. Uh, but then when once you find that it exists, it's actually very rigid. And uh, you know, I think this, this is a very nice mathematical package which uh, deserves some, some further attention. Um, besides doing this sort of general calculations about abstract homomorphic allotistic theories, we also looked at a few examples. But uh, in particular, we spent some time on, on pure gauge theory, on the homomorphic twist of pure gauge theory in four dimensions, uh, pure and equal one gauge theory in four dimensions. Uh, the homomorphic twist of pure and equal one gauge theory is an homomorphic BF theory deformed by, uh, by, by a coupling, which, only, which is total derivatives, so only affects instant on calculations unless you make it position dependent. Um, if you look at the free theory, the space of local operators is system, system essentially consists of gene variance polynomials in, in B, uh, derivatives of B, and derivatives of C. Uh, this at three levels, you have essentially a Chevalier differential, uh, which maps every, every field to an essentially gauge transformation, which parameter C, plus some extra corrections proportional to derivatives of C. Uh, at one loop, you get a correction which acts on two letters at a time and adds two derivatives, and so on and so forth. Uh, right, so sorry, a point that I should have made before and I, I, I for, forgot to, to mention is that I'll tell you the sort of infinite, infinite perturbative expansion of loop corrections to the differential. The cohomology problem at the perturbative level is actually well defined. In a sense, there is a ghost number grading. Which would such that if you look at the space of local operators in the free theory of some ghost number, the action of the of these infinite uh, power series actually truncates, you get a well-defined cohomology problem. So it does make sense to talk about the perturbative holomorphic factorization algebra of these quantum field theories. And then you can try to ask if non-perturbative corrections are available. Um, now 
one of the striking facts we found about pure gauge theory is that this uh, the divergence of the stress tensor which generates uh, which generates uh, this infinite symmetry algebra of uh, Hamiltonian symplectomorphism of space time in this pure gauge theory only is actually exact Q exact. It gives rise to a phenomenon with that holomorphic confinement where the holomorphic, this holomorphic BF theory uh, is actually secretly topological. So you, you take it, you took it for a national equal language theory, you do an holomorphic twist, you expect it to find a holomorphic theory, and instead you find a topological theory. I find this very amusing because if I assume that non perturbative corrections preserve this statement, then you get a strong constraint to the inferred behavior of the theory. As if a theory is, is topologically in the UV, it has to be topologically in the infrared as well. So whatever infrared degrees of freedom you find must have also the property that the holomorphic twist is topological. Now, of course, being topological is compatible with the infrared behavior we expect to see in pure case theory, which is that of confinement. Uh, but I, you know, I find it very amusing that you can find that you know a trace, a, a shadow of confinement in the perturbative calculation in this holomorphic twisted theory. And you know, I, I hope it's sort of a, a, hybrid, you know, a, a manifestation of um, of the power of this holomorphic twist to to study the physics of these theories. Uh, we have also been computing the sort of the low level cohomology numerically for these theories. And we hope to be able to, to, to learn something about the non-perturbative corrections to the, to the factorization algebra from these numerical calculations. Um, we've done some large end calculations as well. Um, a, a fun feature is that a tall writing down an, an holographic dual for the physical pure and equal one gauge theory is kind of tricky. Uh, and not very manageable. The holomorphically twisted theory has a very transparent holographic dual involving the beam model in the presence of a, of a certain back reaction. And we're trying to learn how to compute brackets, you know, compute holomorphic factorization algebra on both sides of this duality and perhaps build it up into a full holomorphic you know, sort of example of twisted holography. Another amusing fact is that this holographic construction can be extended to SQCD with a finite number of flavors as well, just by adding some extra brains into the model. So uh, where to go from here? I think we really need to study the representation theory of this infinite dimensional holomorphic factorization algebras in four dimensions. Uh, the, the, the chance that they will constrain the phys the non-perturbative physics of, of inequality and gauge theories is just It's, it's just very striking. I think um, I think we need to figure out if this is the case or not. We need to figure out how much physics can we extract from these representation theory problems. Uh, we have cyber dualities, so we can really test uh, our test our calculations. We in our so the existence of cyber duality should really allow us to, to put. To, to formulate examples on opportunity corrections and, and, and constrain them. Um, so we have sort of a framework to follow. We, we need to understand all of the perturbative calculation, the perturbative of factorization algebra, and then we need to understand how to deform them in such a way that it's compatible with several dualities uh, to include non perturbative effects. Uh, there is a very large variety of holography calculations that can be done. Besides the pure gauge theory example I discussed in the previous slide, all of those ADS Python's Sasaki Einstein backgrounds can be treated in a sort of a can be twisted. And one can study twisted supergravity in, in those backgrounds and compare them with the holomorphic twist of the quiver, corresponding quiver gauge theories. There has been some work done on this before, but not in a systematic way, in particular, including the perturbative corrections. And then uh, you know, the general formula we wrote applies to many other situations. Uh, there are plenty of other holomorphic, holomorphic topological twists that one can study and that can be interesting. Uh, for example, I'm very curious about three-dimensional and equal two theories, and there are 
almost into political twist. I think that there is some kind of a formality theorem for kernel algebras that might be uncovered there. And it might also be possible to study the holomorphic twist of theories in dimension greater than four. Uh, those are situations where instead of having a UV Lagrangian and then some strong couple of physics, strong couple of, uh, physics, you have some unknown UV CFT. And there are relevant deformations which make it float with thread free uh, gauge theories. And I think it would be conceivable that one can study the holomorphic twist of this Lagrangian infrared uh, free theories and try to guess what the UV, uh, what the holomorphic twist of the UV theory could be. Uh, so I think there is a lot of work to do. And these are problems which are mathematically well defined and mathematically rigorous. So I think there is a chance of a lot of, and also physically interesting. So I think there is a lot of, uh, there is a chance of a lot of interplay and cross fertilization between. Uh, math and physics in this topic. Uh, so I invite you to, to get into it. I think it's, uh, I think it's, it's going to be fun. Uh, okay. And then, any, any last questions? Is there time? Mm, uh, I have a question if there is time. So the question is, before twisting, the theory is supersymmetric, right? So yes. uh, in this, in that sense, it obeys some non-normalization theorems. Yes. So uh, when you, if you define the uh, cohomology operator Q using one of the chiral ring operators, then uh, there wouldn't be any quantum corrections, right? Because it's just the... Actually there are, I mean, the, as I said, generalized condition anomalies, uh, just the one loop anomaly, they will look at the function, they have all corrections to the carrying relations or differentials. Okay, any other questions? Uh, uh, could you please uh, explain the, uh, the UA finiteness of uh, the graph integrals uh, in more detail? Uh, because in conservative model, he used uh, configuration space mm -hmm. uh, integrals. And then use uh, uh, integration by parts and to prove the associativity. So in, in this case, uh, so yeah, how to say the UA finite is uh, here? Um, so the, yeah, I don't know how to, how to, to say. Let's see. So if you, if you take conservative original construction, uh, you can write, you can just, so you can take the, let me use that, exa that example. So you can take the B model in two dimensions, three chirals, and apply this formula to study the, uh, to study the higher brackets. Uh, if you do that, you will find that, so when you update the Del Bar operator on this, on this uh, product of propagators, you get a sum of terms. Uh, and you can write each of these terms in, in some Zwinger parameterization, for example. And you get some, some integration regions in the space of Zwinger parameters, which depend on the UV and IR regulators. But remarkably, all of these terms combine together to give you a, a bigger integration region where the UV, where the dependence on the UV cutoff sort of completely drops out. And the infrared cutoffs can also be uh, removed without any problem. Um, then, uh, so you, did, that leaves you some, 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 some integrals, which then reduce directly to, to conservation integrals. I mean, there are some Gaussian integrals in the, uh, in the sort of some radial directions. And then once you do the radial integrals, you're left on, with integrals over angles, which are conservation uh, configuration space integrals. Uh, so here, the uh, associativity of uh, the holomorphic factorization algebra also follows uh, from a version of uh, Stokes, uh, Stokes theorem, right? Yes, yeah. The integration regions are essentially just the same as conservative regions, but complexified. So 
whenever you have an angle, now you have a sort of a, a point in C star. And instead of just being an area, you're computing a Fourier transform. But otherwise, they're very similar. So, I mean, they, 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 they have to be a little bit more complicated because these integrals here are not giving us just numbers, they're giving us functions. Because in the Lomophic twist, you know, you're computing lambda brackets, so there are the lambda parameters uh, around. But the regions are, for some funny coincidence, the regions which occur in the Lomophic twist in, in four dimensions and the regions which occur in two dimensional topological twists are literally the same. So you take Konsevich regions, you promote C angles to C star, and then all the combinatorics of boundary conditions of uh, sort of of these regions is the same. So these regions satisfy some quadratic identity themselves, uh, which then imply the, the, the identities for the integrals. So sort of mm -hmm. the same uh, geometric quadratic identities which make conservative story work on the plane would also make the four-dimensional story work. Uh, yeah, so one question about the non-perturbative corrections. Do the... Mm -hmm. Does the holomorphic twist help clarifying what kind of non-perturbative correction you have in, in let's say, gauge, even pure gauge theory, right, in equal one? Because it's not like instant times, like when you have a supercharge or so what you even sum over, what, what kind of, so does the holomorphic twist clarify what kind of non-perturbative corrections or you would formulate them in the class integral? Well, so what happens is that, <clears throat> uh, the perturbative theory has a bit more symmetry than the non-perturbative one, because you know there, there are some symmetries which are anomalous, it won't do, but you know the anomaly is controlled by by the integral of some phase of f with f, which means that in the they give you they give you uh, selection rules which are only broken non perturbatively. Uh, so <clears throat> right, so you can do your perturbative calculation. And then you might hope that the non perturbative calculations are sort of a, uh, add an extra differential on top of that, which you know, relates spaces with different quantum numbers uh, of the perturbative theory, something like a spectral sequence sort of uh, situation. Uh, but in practice, what what one should do and what we are hoping to do over the last the next few months is you can take an example such as the basic several duality example and compute the perturbative holomorphic twist on both sides and then look at which kind of differential would be needed to make them agree. Uh, my expectation is that the differential will, will be a standard instant on correction, meaning that the amount by which you break the, uh, the perturbative Some, the, 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 how do you call it? Selection rules uh, will be just what you expect from the set of one instant or two instant or so three instant Now, I, I know that things like the expectation value of local operators tend to have fractional instant on effects in the physical theory. Uh, I, so, so maybe. So I do not know at this point that the Lomophic transition algebra, the corrections to the Lomophic transition algebra will just take the form of standard instant on effects or if they will require something more exotic. I, I think this just has to be gleaned from looking at concrete examples. If it was just standard instant on effects, then there is a chance that they are mathematically computable, perhaps as some integral over the space of instantons, but maybe that's too optimistic. Right. Thank you.